Hey everyone, today we're diving into some epic ancient Chinese mythology. Now this isn't your typical history lesson. We're talking full-on fantasy with monsters, chaos, and mind-blowing events that even most Chinese folks don't really believe. But that's what makes it so fun, right? The more unbelievable, the better. So, let's set the stage. Picture this. The universe was just a vast, empty space. No sky, no earth, no clouds, no sun just darkness and swirling chaos. After ages, this chaos started to clump together, forming a huge solid egg. And inside this egg, a giant named Pangu was born. He slept in there for a whopping 18,000 years. When Pangu finally woke up, he felt pretty cramped in that egg. So he grabbed his giant shiny axe and decided to smash his way out. He hacked and slashed until, crack, the egg split open with a massive roar. The chaotic energy inside burst out, floating up like gas, or sinking down like heavy stones. But Pengu wasn't in the clear yet. He realized that if he didn't hold the chaos apart, it might trap him again. So, he lifted the light, floating stuff with his hands, and stomped the heavy stuff with his feet. And just like that he started growing, pushing the sky and the earth apart. He grew for another 18,000 years until the sky was way up high and the earth was way down low with a distance of 90,000 miles between them. But alas, even Pangu couldn't live forever. Exhausted from holding up the sky for all that time, he collapsed and died. But his death wasn't in vain. His body transformed into the world around us. His eyes became the sun and moon. His breath turned into the wind and clouds. His voice echoed as thunder. His skin and hair grew into plants and trees. His muscles formed the mountains. His blood flowed as rivers and seas, and his bones scattered as rocks and stones. And just like that, the world as we know it began. Fast forward through countless ages, and from Pangu's body, countless life forms were born. One day, a goddess named Nua descended from the heavens to check out the earth. She saw animals like deer, bears, birds, and rabbits roaming around. But no one was there to truly appreciate the beauty of this paradise. Determined to change that, Niwa decided to create beings in her own image. She grabbed a huge vine and started whipping the mud by the river. The mud, infused with Pengu's life essence, splattered everywhere, forming tiny creatures with heads, arms, legs, and eyes. These little beings started moving and making noises and voila, humans were born. They spread out, multiplied, and soon the world was bustling with human life. But peace didn't last long. Trouble came when two gods, Gong Gong, the god of water, and Zhirong, the god of fire, started a massive battle. The earth was thrown into chaos, lakes and rivers boiled, monsters rampaged, and it was total mayhem. The battle ended with Gong Gong losing to Zhirong, but the aftermath was even worse. In his rage, Gong Gong slammed into the sacred mountain, Bu Zhou, which supported the sky. The mountain shattered, and the sky and earth tilted. Floodwaters poured out, threatening to wipe out humanity. Nua couldn't bear to see her creation perish. She saved drowning humans, fought off monsters, and then set out to fix the world. She called upon a giant turtle, and despite the turtle's protests, took its four legs to prop up the sky. The sky was stable, but the earth remained tilted, which is why all of China's rivers flow east to the sea. The turtle, now legless, crawled away slowly just as it does today. In ancient Chinese mythology, long before the rise of civilization, there was a time known as the Era of Yao and Shun, a legendary golden age ruled by two wise and virtuous emperors. However, even in this idyllic period, challenges arose, particularly during the reign of Emperor Yao. At the eastern edge of the world stood a massive towering mulberry tree. In its branches lived 10 birds, but these were no ordinary birds. They were golden three-legged creatures, the children of the Jade Emperor, the ruler of heaven. Each day, one of these birds would take turns flying across the sky, and the people called this bird the sun. For countless millennia, the birds faithfully followed this routine. But one day, out of boredom or perhaps mischief, all ten birds decided to soar into the sky together. The result was catastrophic. Ten suns blazed in the sky at once, unleashing unbearable heat upon the earth. The land was scorched, fields and grasslands burned fiercely, 
and even lakes and rivers began to boil. As chaos reigned, monstrous creatures appeared. A massive serpent capable of swallowing elephants whole. A ferocious bird with sharp teeth and weapons. A colossal man-eating boar and a fearsome dragon with nine heads that spewed fire and venom. It was as if the world had turned into a living hell. In desperation, Emperor Yao offered a prayer to the heavens, pleading for salvation. The Jade Emperor responded by sending a hero to save humanity, a divine archer named Hu Yi, known for his unmatched skill in archery and incredible speed. The Jade Emperor ordered Hu Yi to subdue the Golden Birds and restore order to the earth. Hu Yi descended to the mortal world with his beautiful wife, Chang'e, and began his mission. With precision, Hu Yi shot down one bird after another, each arrow hitting its mark perfectly. However, as the last bird prepared to take flight, Emperor Yao grew concerned. If Hu Yi killed the final bird, the world would be plunged into darkness and life would be impossible without the sun. To prevent this, Yao secretly removed one of Hu Yi's arrows leaving him with just enough to spare the final bird. With the Earth's temperature returning to normal, Ho Yi turned his attention to the monsters terrorizing the land. He defeated the giant serpent with a single slash, broke the sharp weapons and teeth of the monstrous bird, and shot through the shield of the boar. Finally, he vanquished the dragon, successfully completing his divine mission. But instead of receiving praise, Ho Yi faced the wrath of the Jade Emperor. The golden birds he had slain were the Emperor's children, I told you to subdue them, not to kill them, the Jade Emperor thundered, furious at the loss of his sons. As punishment, he stripped Hu Yi and Chang'e of their divine status, condemning them to live as mere mortals. They could no longer ascend to heaven, and they now suffered from hunger, cold, and the fear of death. As time passed, Chang'e grew increasingly distressed by her mortality. She couldn't bear the thought of aging and eventually dying, which led her to tears and constant complaints. Desperate to alleviate her suffering, Hu Yi sought a way to regain their immortality. He remembered hearing of the Queen Mother of the West, a goddess who resided in the distant Kunlun Mountains, where she kept the elixir of immortality. Hu Yi embarked on a long and perilous journey, braving dangerous terrains and fending off attacks from demons, until he finally reached the Kunlun Mountains and met the Queen Mother. She had only two pills left. One would grant immortality, and two would allow the taker to ascend to godhood and return to heaven. Recognizing the couple's past heroism, she gave Hu Yi both pills, urging him to share them with his wife. Overjoyed, Hu Yi returned home with the elixir. Exhausted from the journey, he fell into a deep sleep, unaware of the temptation that would overcome Chang'e. That night, unable to resist, Chang'e stared at the pills, contemplating their power. If she took one, she'd gain immortality. If she took both, she'd return to heaven. After much hesitation, Chang'e swallowed both pills. Her body began to glow, and she floated into the sky, leaving Hu Yi behind. When Hu Yi awoke and discovered what had happened, he was heartbroken. He spent the rest of his days in sorrow, eventually taking on an apprentice named Feng Meng. Tragically, Hu Yi's life ended at the hands of Feng Meng, who killed him with a peachwood club. This death gave rise to the belief that spirits fear peachwood, which is why peaches are not placed on altars during offerings. As for Chang'e, she reached heaven only to face the Jade Emperor's fury once more. How dare you return here after what you've done? Enraged, the Jade Emperor banished her to the cold, desolate moon, transforming her into a hideous toad. It's said that the dark spots on the moon are the shadows of Chang'e, now a toad, forever weeping in her lunar prison. Like and subscribe and I, Nuwa, will bestow my blessings upon you. If not, well... Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. Today we're diving into the epic and mystical world of Japanese creation myths. Get ready for a story that's packed with gods, romance, betrayal, and epic battles. We're talking about the legendary tale of Izanagi and Izanami. In the beginning, Japan was nothing but a vast chaotic ocean, an endless sea of swirling chaos. But up in the heavens, a group of divine beings decided it was time to bring order to this watery mess. These gods were Izanagi and Izanami, 
the first male and female deities. Their mission? To create the world. Pretty ambitious, right? The sky gods handed Izanagi a magical, jewel-adorned spear and told him to stir the chaotic waters below. So they dipped the spear into the ocean, and as they pulled it out, and that's how the Japanese archipelago was born. But Izanagi and Izanami didn't stop there. They created more islands, including Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu, along with mountains, rivers, seas, and forests. They were on a roll. Together, they gave birth to the elements and many gods. But their story took a tragic turn when Izanami, while giving birth to the fire god Kagutsuchi, was fatally burned. Heartbroken, Izanami died and descended to Yomi, the land of the dead. Izanagi, devastated by her loss, decided he had to see her one last time. So he ventured into the underworld. When Izanagi found Izanami, she warned him not to look at her. But driven by love and curiosity, he lit a torch and saw her transformed into a decaying figure covered in maggots. Horrified, he fled, pursued by the enraged Izanami and the spirits of the underworld. Izanagi barely escaped and, feeling defiled, sealing the entrance to Yomi with a large boulder. This act transformed Izanami into a goddess of death, and Izanagi became a god of life and purification, performed a cleansing ritual. And guess what? As he washed his face, three powerful deities were born. From his left eye, the radiant sun goddess Amaterasu emerged. From his right eye, the calm moon god Tsukuyomi, and from his nose, the stormy sea god Suzanu. These three gods would go on to play major roles in Japanese mythology. But not everything was peaceful in the divine family. Suzanu, wild and unruly, caused chaos wherever he went, even scaring his sister Amaterasu so much that she hid in a cave, plunging the world into darkness. The other gods had to come up with a clever plan to lure Amaterasu out. They threw a party right outside the cave, complete with music and dancing. Curious about the commotion, Amaterasu peeked out, saw her reflection in a mirror, and was coaxed back into the world, bringing light with her. Meanwhile, Suzanu went on an epic quest and defeated the fearsome eight-headed dragon, Yamada no Orochi. From the dragon's tail, he pulled out a magical sword, which he later gifted to Amaterasu as a token of peace. Susanu also found love with Kushinata Haim, and together they founded a new land. He became a hero and a founding ancestor of many important deities. Amaterasu's lineage continued with her grandson, Ninigi no Makoto, who descended to Earth to rule. He became the ancestor of Japan's emperors, linking the imperial family directly to the gods. And that's the incredible story of Izanagi and Izanami, and how the land of Japan and its divine rulers came to be. From the chaos of the primordial sea to the birth of the sun, moon, and storm gods, Japanese mythology is full of epic tales and fascinating characters. If you don't subscribe and like, I might just disappear again. When we think about the creation myths of human civilizations, many people think of the Garden of Eden story. In the Eden story, God rules over humans with blessings and curses, using both rewards and punishments. God and humans are separate, and God controls human consciousness by sometimes giving blessings and sometimes curses. In contrast, the Korean creation story, centered around the goddess Mago, shows a philosophy of peace and coexistence between the divine and humans, highlighting the unity of nature and humanity. At first, there was only warm sunlight, with nothing visible. In this void, the yin and yang of the universe met and created a perfect life form, Mother Mago, the origin of humanity. Mother Earth Mago, gave birth to children through the harmonious laws of the universe. Their names were Gongi and Sohi. Mother Mago sang a beautiful song with the harmonious laws and rhythms of the universe, marking the beginning of the first resonance. After the resonance, Mother Mago placed the earth, sea, and fire on the world, creating a beautiful earth with mountains, rivers, animals, and birds. Among the countless stars, the earth was just a single pearl in the universe. With the revival of the resonance, heaven and earth were created, and the central mass of energy exploded, giving birth to countless stars and forming seas and lands. Warm energy enveloped the deep earth, 
warmed by sunlight and heat, allowing all kinds of life to thrive. Gunghi and Sohi, like Mago, bore four sons and four daughters through the yin and yang of the universe. These were Huanggung, Baekso, Cheonggung, and Hyukso. Gunghi and Sohi nurtured their offspring with the essence of Mago Castle. Following Mother Mago's command, their sons and daughters opened their ribs and gave birth to more offspring, who became the ancestors of the first humans on Earth. From then on, men and women met, married and multiplied, with about 3,000 people living within Mago Castle. They were free, pure and inherently wise, like beings of the sky. The people of Mago Castle could hear and speak without making a sound, always listening to the resonance of the heavens, understanding the principles of harmony, and existing as heavenly descendants and divine beings. One day Jiso took several people to Yuchon to drink their only energy source, Jiyu. However, as the population of Mago Castle grew, the Jiyu spring was insufficient for everyone. After giving up his turn five times, Jiso could not drink Jiyu and returned. Hungry and tired, he tasted the fruit on a hill. The sweet and tempting taste of the grapes revived his senses, but made him forget the harmony of the heavens. Excitedly, he exclaimed, This must be the power of grapes. People curious tasted the grapes and found the taste as alluring as Jiso's description. As more people tasted the grapes, their strong flavor awakened their senses, causing saliva to form in their mouths and teeth to grow, making their flesh impure and their minds confused. Eventually, they forgot the laws and harmonious resonance of the heavens, losing their beauty. Blaming Jiso for introducing them to the grapes, people resented him. Ashamed, Jiso led a group out of the castle and hid. Those who ate the grapes and those who couldn't protect them all left, scattering everywhere. The elder of Mago Castle, Huang Gung, pitied the young descendants and lamented, Your delusions have changed your nature, and you must leave the castle. However, if you resist temptation and regain your true nature, you may return. As the elder, Huang Gung tied a white cloth and apologized to Mother Mago, vowing to lead the group and reclaim their nature, promising to return. With the calamity of the five senses pushing them out, those who left Mago Castle became more foolish. To protect Mago Castle, they had to return to their original, perfect state. The elders, Huang Gung, Bekso, Chonggung, and Hyukso, had to live scattered in all directions, always remembering the vow of restoration. Huang Gung taught his followers how to make food from arrowroot and ordered them to live separately. Chong Gung led his group to the east, Bekso to the west, Hyukso to the south, and Huang Gung went to the cold and harsh north, to Tian Mountain, fulfilling his promise of restoration. Upon reaching Tian Mountain, Huang Gung reaffirmed the vow of restoration, helping his group practice the way of heaven and earth. His will was passed down to his three sons. The eldest, Yuan, followed his father's will, dedicated to revealing the unity of the universe's essence. Yuin, regarded as a teacher by all, restored the deteriorated consciousness of the people, teaching them to cook food with fire. Those who inherited the heavenly lineage revered Yuin as their master. After a thousand years, Yuin passed on the heavenly mark to his son, Hanin, before retreating into the mountains, fulfilling the vow of restoration. Hanin, inheriting the heavenly seal, illuminated the world, restoring people's original form, this was the virtue of Huang Gung, Yuin, and Hanin, who followed the heavenly way and fulfilled the vow of restoration. Hanin upheld the heavenly law, living a life of light for others, like a heavenly being in Mago Castle. The twelve nations of Korea, led by Hanin's nine brothers, spread the teachings of the heavenly lineage, upholding the vow of restoration and growing as descendants of heaven. The peaceful Korea had five teachings known as Shinsi Five Principles. Be honest and trustworthy without deceit. Be respectful and diligent, not lazy. Be filial and obedient, not rebellious. Be righteous and humble, not promiscuous. Be humble and harmonious, not contentious. Hanin, living in Tian Mountain, awakened people with the law of the heavenly seal, maintaining the vow of restoration for seven generations, totaling 3,000 Tijiwa one years. The lineage of the Korean people, starting with Mother Earth Mago, continued through Huang Gung, Yuin, and Hanin. The Korean lineage of heavenly descendants carried on through the 18th Hwanung and the 47th Dungun, embodying the origin of humanity 
and the root of the Korean people, uniting life and cosmic harmony. Hi everyone, today we're diving into an important piece of Korean history, the Dangun myth. This story is about the origins of the Korean people and the founding of Korea's first kingdom, Gojoseon. The Dangun myth is all about Dangun Wangjiam, the legendary founder of Gojoseon. This myth is recorded in ancient texts like Samguk Yusa and Dongguk Tonggam. Let's break down the story. A long time ago, there was a sky god named Huanin. His son, Huanong, wanted to rule over the human world. Huanin allowed his son to descend to earth and find a place to govern. Huanong chose Bekdu Mountain, known as Taibek Mountain back then, and created a city called Shinshi. In the Dangun myth, the deities that Huanong brought down with him are as follows. Pungbek, wind deity, the god who governs the wind. Pungbek was responsible for controlling the wind in the human world, working alongside Huanong. Wusa, rain deity, the god who governs the rain. Yusei was in charge of overseeing the rain in the human world and collaborated with Huanong. Unsa, cloud deity, the god who governs the clouds. Unsa managed the clouds in the human world and performed his duties alongside Wanung. These three deities together with Wanung descended to the human world and oversaw 360 human affairs, including agriculture, life, disease, punishment, and morality. Wanung, along with his divine helpers, taught humans how to farm, use medicine and live morally. During this time, a bear and a tiger appeared, both wishing to become human. Wanung told the bear and the tiger that they could become human if they stayed in a dark cave for 100 days, eating only mugwort and garlic. The tiger gave up but the bear endured and eventually transformed into a woman. This woman is called Ong Niao. Ong Niao, now a human, was lonely. Huanong then married her, and they had a son named Dangun Wangjum. Dangun grew up and in 2333 BC he founded the first Korean kingdom, Gojoseon. The Dangun myth isn't just a story, it's a crucial part of Korean identity and pride. Even today, Koreans look to this myth to understand their roots. This myth plays an essential role in Korean history and culture, helping to explain the country's origins and the identity of its people. If you subscribe and like, I, the Mother Margot, will bless you.